All right, I'm Adnan Darwish, and this is joint work with August Hirth. This work is actually part of a broader research agenda, which is concerned with the reasoning about the behavior of machine learning systems. As we know, these systems are learned from data, and they take uh, various forms, including Bayesian networks, neural networks, random forests. But they're typically boxes that implement classifiers uh, in the sense that they take instances and they output decisions on these instances. And uh, people are interested in reasoning about the behavior of these systems, including explaining their decisions. And the basic observation underlying this work is that uh, while these systems are uh, learned from data and numeric in nature, uh, they typically implement discrete decision functions. The input is discrete and the output is discrete. So what we can do is capture that input-output behavior in a symbolic way, and then use that symbolic representation to do the reasoning. So let's take a concrete example. Uh, what you have here on the left is uh, one of the simplest machine learning systems you can have, a naive base classifier. We have features, and then we have a class variable. You typically give me an instance, which fixes the value of these features. We compute the probability on the class variable, check against the threshold, and then render a decision. So even though the system is numeric and learned from data, it does actually implement a discrete decision function in the sense that the input are discrete values of these variables and the output is a discrete decision. And one way to represent such an input-output behavior symbolically is using decision graphs. So in this case, uh, this decision graph was compiled from this naive base classifier and we're guaranteed that the system on the left and the system on the right will make the exact same decision on every instance. Uh, it doesn't have to be a decision graph, could be in another type of uh, symbolic representation, and it's typically a tractable uh, circuit representation. In fact, while this approach is pretty old from about uh, 17 years ago, uh, the approach for compiling naive base classifiers and decision graphs, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of work on uh, this compilation idea and this scope was expanded beyond Bayesian networks. Uh, in this work, we assume that the compilation process took place and we are handed a tractable circuit representation of the input-output behavior of the machine learning system. And we're gonna be focusing on the reasoning part and in particular explaining the decisions of uh, that machine learning classifier. And we're building on this proposal from about two years ago, which, uh, referred to as PI explanations, which in this figure we also call sufficient reason. So the idea here is pretty simple. You have a box, you give it an instance, let's say you have 100 features, and then the box makes a decision and say, why did you make that decision? The PI explanation uh, gives you back a minimal set of instance characteristics that are guaranteed to trigger that decision. Uh, meaning, out of the 100, it may come back with seven of them and say these seven, if you fix them, the decision will stick regardless of how you change the other 93. And of course, there could be more than one PI explanation, which from now on, I'm going to be referring to again as a sufficient uh, reason. So before we tell you what is it that we're contributing to the story and how we're extending it further, let's just take a concrete example first. So here we have a, the, our original classifier from earlier, and we have a patient, Sally, that tested negative for all of these tests, and she was classified as not pregnant, and we ask why. And the general explanation here is because the scanning test came out negative, and one of the blood and the urine tests came out negative. Now, how did we get that statement? Because in this case, we have two sufficient reasons. And the first one says scanning negative, blood negative. The second one says scanning negative, urine negative. Now, if you take the disjunction of these guys, you get something that we call in this paper the complete reason behind the decision, which is again, the disjunction of all sufficient reasons for that decision. It turns out to be the fundamental notion in this paper and the center of all of the results. And you'll see why. Why would you want to get the complete reason? And how can you get it? and what can you do uh, with it. But before we get to that, let me just do one more bit about the underlying theory behind all of this, which is the notion of prime implicance, which is also the reason behind the name PI explanation. This is a notion that's been in computer science for a very long time, studying in AI in particular. You have a Boolean function, you try to find a minimal setting of the variables that guarantee the function to trigger. In this case, there are three of them. Each one of these is guaranteed to make the function generate a one regardless of what the other variables might be. So 
The notion of a PI explanation is that if you have an instance and a corresponding decision and you say, why did you make that decision? You simply find the prime implicants that are compatible with the instance. And in this case, there's only two. Uh, those are your sufficient reasons or your PI explanations. Now, if you have a negative decision, you do the same thing, but you have to work with the complement of that particular function. Now, as some of you may know, one of the issues with prime implicants is there could be an exponential number of them, and that would pose a problem for certain kind of queries like the one I'm going to be showing you next, which require us to actually uh, use the notion of a complete reason. So the, the core contribution, as I mentioned in this uh, paper, is the notion of a complete reason being a disjunction, a disjunction of all sufficient reasons. The reason we care about it is that we want to avoid computing sufficient reasons explicitly in some cases. We'll see an example of that. The other fundamental notion from a practical point of view is the notion of a reason circuit. And this is a tractable circuit representation of the complete reason. So not only do I want to get a formula that represents the disjunction of all sufficient reasons, I want to represent that formula in a tractable way because I'm gonna use it as a basis to do all kind of things as we will mention later. Now, let's go ahead and uh, see a complete example that puts all of these things together. What we have here is a admission classifier. It's in the form of a binary decision diagram or an OBDD. Here are the features. And one of them is designated as protected. I'm interested in knowing whether a particular decision depended on someone coming from a rich hometown or not we will say that a decision is biased, a decision on instance X is biased. If it can be different on another instance Y that disagrees with X on protected features only, if that happens, then the decision is biased. And one of the theorems in the paper says that a decision is biased if and only if each of its sufficient reasons contains at least one protected feature. This is an example of an analysis which requires one in principle to examine every sufficient reason behind a decision, something that we would like to avoid and can avoid as we will show later. So what can we do here? Here's a concrete example to illustrate that. Uh, we have an applicant, Robin, and here are the characteristics of Robin. She was admitted, we ask why? And it turns out there are five sufficient reasons behind the decision on Robin. And if I'm, for example, trying to do a decision bias, I want to know if this decision was biased or not, then I have to enumerate these and check them one by one. But instead, what we will do is we will get a reason circuit for that decision, which is a circuit, as I mentioned, that happens to be equivalent to the disjunction of all of these. And then we're going to use that to determine bias and other queries that I'm going to mention later. The interesting thing is that this reason circuit can be obtained in linear time from the classifier and an instance, assuming that the classifier is represented in a particular form. And that form includes OBDDs and a particular class of tractable circuits known as decision DNF. Moreover, this reason circuit happens to be monotone, which means it is tractable, allowing us to do various things efficiently on it. So if we try to check decision bias based on the circuit, we will actually find that this decision is not biased. And you can see that by looking at the, uh, explicitly looking at the sufficient reasons and realizing that the protected feature appear on only three of them, but not all of them. And here enforces the protected feature must appear in all of them for the decision to be biased. Uh, interestingly enough, in the paper, we show another theorem that based on this result concludes that even though the decision is not biased, the classifier is biased. That is, it is guaranteed to make another biased decision, not this one, but some other one, but I'll leave that to the paper for you to check. Now, how do we compute the reason circuit? It's mechanically a very simple and efficient process. You start with the classifier, and you have, in this case, a particular instance. We're trying to compute a reason circuit for the decision on that instance. The first step is called consensus, which effectively adds a bunch of nodes to the classifier circuit, the ones in double circle. And this operation of consensus is very similar to the consensus operation on disjunctive normal form. It just generalizes it to circuits as some kind of deductive closure. And the second transformation is called filtering, where we actually take the consensus circuit and the instance and then drop some of the nodes. Those are the ones that are shaded here 
and then we end up effectively getting the reason circuit for the decision on that instance. The interesting thing is each one of these transformations that is computing the consensus circuit and then computing the filtered circuit, both of these are linear time operations. So basically obtaining a reason circuit from a classifier and an instance is a linear time operation, assuming that the classifier itself is in a particular form as we mentioned earlier. So, what else can you do with reason circuits once you get them for that? I will actually defer you to a particular section in the paper where we list a whole bunch of queries that may be of interest and show how each one of them can be obtained efficiently, linear and sometimes quadratic time based on the reason circuit. And to whet your appetite, I will mention one particular class of queries called counterfactual queries that we define and show how you actually can evaluate based on reason circuits. So this notion is very important. It is an abstraction of why a decision was made. And if you have it in a tractable form, then you can do all kind of interesting things. And let me conclude again with this slide that shows that this is part of a broader research agenda that I call the compile then reason paradigm, uh, which allows us to reason about the behavior of machine learning systems symbolically you can do this using other paradigms, for example, using set solvers. And while our previous work on this paradigm has been mostly focused on the compilation part and some reasoning, this particular work is completely dedicated to reasoning about the behavior of the machine learning system once you have its input-output behavior captured as a tractable circuit. Thank you.